We'll start off uh, with Jurist from Wisconsin. How are you? How you doing, Matt? Pretty good. Uh, I got a few questions, I guess. Uh, you remember the show you guys had a couple of weeks ago uh, about with the brain dead woman? Yes. Mm. Yeah, and they were saying dead is dead. Brain dead is dead. Yes. But she actually wasn't dead. Actually, she was dead. No, and, she's I, alive. and I think now she is, right? Yeah, you know they yeah. took her off the machine, right? Okay, well, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's about well, as dead as you get. She is. But at that time, when the whole debate was going on, uh, she actually wasn't dead. Well, was there were dead. machines pumping uh, fluid through her body and keeping her organs alive. Well, they, were, they had her on a ventilator. Her heart just... <laughs> Your heart just kept going. Sure. Mm -hmm. So they kept her on a ventilator. But if you would have cut her, she would have bled. And if you would have stitched her up, she would have healed. Well, you know what? Um, when somebody's dead, they still will bleed. Yeah, no. Yeah, actually, <laughs> cut their head off. There's a whole bunch of blood. Keeps right on coming well, out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, yeah. It's, okay, it's, so. it's a case of, you know, is that any kind of a quality of life that you think is? Well, see, the child that was living within her, though. Which and was um, non-viable, by the way, and also dead. What do you mean non-viable? We were all, we were all non-viable. No, I'm, so, I'm sorry. If I'm you were non-viable, you wouldn't have been born. But they're, they're, not all fetuses are actually viable. This one wasn't, and it's dead. Um, you, you, you seem to have this really kind of simplistic notion of, of what life is and what counts. But anyway, you know, you had emailed us with all sorts of points, and you have other questions over here. So... Go ahead and get to whatever you called about. Okay, uh, what is atheism based on? Um, well, it depends. It, not all not all atheists are atheists for the same reasons. Well, what, uh, some I, are. I, I, some I, I, are. I, what, can I finish my answer? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, some are atheists because of reason and skeptic, a critical evaluation of various God claims um, that they've determined have failed to meet their burden of proof. I'm sure there are plenty of atheists who are atheists for really bad reasons, um, reasons that aren't you know, logically sound and aren't based on a, a rational consideration of the claims. Um, but I don't see where that matters that much because it, the, the burden of proof is on the claim that there is a God. Well, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying whether or not uh, it's logical or not here. What I'm saying is, is your, is your worldview logical? Because you can't use reason and logic to prove reason and logic. Well, actually, you kind of can. Um, but I understand the, the problem you see with it. I don't understand why you're raising this point, though. Well, because it's inherently circular. So you can't, you can't say that your worldview is, is logical no, and reasonable. So that you're, you're confusing the fact that you cannot demonstrate uh, the completeness of this. But as far as practical demonstrations, of what's reasonable and logical, it's it's about internal consistency, and since it's all consistent with the universal experience, and because we can demonstrate the uh, absurdity of the logical absolutes not being true, um, is, that, that's, is that absolutely that's, true? Yes. Well, then, then you just demonstrated there is the truth. Okay. Did I? I don't know why you're objecting to that. Did I claim there wasn't? Yeah, you just said you you can you can logically demonstrate that the, that there's absurdities to absolute truth. Yes. No. 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 I said, no, I said to the logical absolutes. I none of this has anything to do with what you wrote, with what you asked. So I mean, can you get to whatever your question is? Okay. So now my next question is: uh, uh, You said that you're for the separation, the peaceful or good good separation of church and state. Yes, yeah, we support separation of church and state. Well, so why is it that, that your spirituality should be the only thing that the government is based on? We have no spirituality. Yes, and we, we No, we don't, and we're not expecting the government to be based on our spirituality at all. Well, I guess we have to understand what spirituality is. That'd be really good since nobody seems to have a good enough definition. And it doesn't even matter what you think what spirituality is. It has to do with the fact that the government, and that what separation of church and state is about is, is the government not either advocating or, or sticking, sticking its nose in the religious affairs of citizens whatsoever, no matter what their beliefs or spirituality might happen to be. That, that, that's exactly what, that's exactly what, uh, what the First Amendment is. The First Amendment yeah. is... Not, Correct. It's yeah. not the separation of church and state. It's just that the government can't tell people how to practice their religion and the free exercise thereof. Yeah, and that's, that's separation and that's, of church and that's state. What, and a, that's why Jefferson referred to that as a, quote, wall of separation. 
that, but that right. had that that had nothing to do with individuals. It would say uh, recriminalizing homosexuality. People would you people would say that that's that's something that you shouldn't be doing. Um. Well, what, because it's religious. I'm, I'm not. Right? Ne I'm not necessarily. Well, it depends. If you are doing it on religious grounds, and so that would put the government in the, in the position of endorsing a specifically religious view, then yes, we could uh, uh, object on church state separation grounds. But I'm not necessarily sure that that's the case, and I don't know why you went to that particular example. Well, I'm just saying because yes. what, what what happens here is that what separation of church and state does is it, is it creates an environment where Christians don't have any say in their culture. That's absolutely completely false. What it does is it makes sure that Christians and other people of other religion can't, by virtue of, of establishing a majority, legislate their personal religious convictions onto others in violation of rights established by the Constitution. Well, the rights of the Constitution say that you have the right to free exercise of your religion. I, yes, yeah. and, and, and so do, I, do you not, do you not jurist, time, jurist, I, do you not realize that that is not an all-encompassing statement, that my, person A's exercise of their religious beliefs can come into conflict with person B's exercise of religious beliefs. And well, James Madison and James back. Madison pointed out that the only valid interference of government and religion was to settle disputes between religions over issues like that. No, see, what, you, what, what you're failing to realize is that it's a battle of ideas. Ideas are inherently spiritual. Uh, well, um, sorry, no. I don't. Can you define spiritual? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're yeah, just so you're to, throwing out a bunch of words, and you're I'm not. Going to define spiritual for you. Spiritual cool. is something is something that has no mass or energy. It, you, you can't be detected. Okay, so what's the difference between means. that and something that just doesn't even exist at all? Well, it, whether it exists, just because you can't test it. Physically tested doesn't mean it doesn't what exist. What you're saying is well, that we're not saying well, he didn't say any. He didn't make any assertions that something doesn't. I, ju jurors, <laughs> let me finish. Come on, he man. didn't make an assertion that something doesn't exist. He asked you what's the difference between your definition of spiritual, because things that don't exist fit into your definition of spiritual as you presented it. And you gave your, def your, your definition of uh, spiritual is also entirely based on negative attributes. No, it's a it's thing that doesn't, it, that has no mass and it has no volume and it has no this and it has no that. Yeah, well, what what I wanted, well, then what I would like to know is what is spiritual then? If I don't want to know what spiritual is not. Tell me what it is. What is it comprised of? And why is it meaningful? And it must be comprised of something meaningful if you think ideas originate there. So what I is it? Ideas are not physical, so they have to be spiritual. Well, I don't know necessarily know that you are are correct, um, because so it, de it depends. It depends. It depends. State, it depends. It depends. If you let me finish on what you mean by ideas, because I have an idea, which means that I'm thinking, and there's a discrete brain state that represents my brain actively processing that idea. What is the idea itself? Does it even exist as a thing? Yes. Ha prove it. Well, how can I, I just have, I think, therefore I am. Yeah, that, that is, I think, that's not, that, that is not a claim that the, that the idea. idea exists. That's I think that, idea. no, it's not. Look, you are so confused. I think, therefore I am, in no way demonstrates that an idea exists as something neither physical nor conceptual or whatever. Um, I think, therefore, I am is was developed by Descartes to demonstrate a solution to hard solipsism of the self. Because I think there must necessarily be some entity who is doing the thinking, even if it's being deceived, because there must be some subject that is being deceived. This has nothing to do with whether or not ideas exist as discrete entities unto themselves. There must be a brain in I think, therefore I am. And a brain creates ideas. Does it? Do rocks create ideas? Do they? You see, what, 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 what uh, atheism boils down to is that you can't know anything. That's not true. Atheism has nothing to do with whether or not you can know anything. Atheism is the position of not believing in a god. It has nothing to say, if let me finish, or I swear I'm going to hang up on you. It has nothing to say about methods of epistemology. It may be derived from examining methods of epistemology, but atheism itself has no, no 
position on methods of epistemology? Wait, I thought it was based on logic and reason. No, because you don't listen. What I said is that some have reached this position as the result of exercising logic and reason, and some haven't. That, that is, do you not understand a causal chain? We begin with logic and reason, and some people have come to the conclusion that the God claims have not met their burden of proof. That does not mean that atheism is generating a position about epistemology. It means that an epistemological position has been used to generate this tentative conclusion about a specific claim. And how do you test that claim? Test what claim? The claim that logic and reason has proven that their claims are, are bad. The, okay, so the claim, some God exists, is the claim that needs to be tested and demonstrated, and until it's done so, by default, it has not done so. Well, there's only two choices. Either God exists or he doesn't. Correct. And if God doesn't exist, then logic and reason are impossible. How do you know that? How, how do you get there? Because you, you can't, because you can't use logic and reason to test and prove that logic. You have to, ha you have to start from a... No, that's not an, that outside. doesn't answer the question. Well, the, the question is, how does the absence of a God make the, the processes of logic and reason impossible for minds to engage in? You haven't answered that question, and in order to do so, first you have to demonstrate, you have to, you have to put this as a falsifiable situation, right? You have to, in a universe in which a god doesn't exist, what would we expect the conditions to be? Okay? You have to be able to speak on that meaningfully. You have to be able to give examples that can then be tested and, and demonstrated to be more likely to be factual than not. And so I mean, in a, in, a, in a universe without a god, you're basically saying that people couldn't think. Correct. Now, how, how have you arrived at that conclusion? Because in order to think, in order to reason, you have to, you can't, you can't I can't say, I can't go along the line to say that I can reason and I, I understand something because I understand it. Well, first off, why, well, why couldn't you, exactly? I mean, how, how, does, how does the act of understanding make the process of understanding I incomprehensible? I mean, we learn by doing things. We learn by interacting with our world. And as part, there's a whole field called epistemology, as Matt just pointed out, which is about understanding the processes by which we derive knowledge. There is, I mean, this, this is an actual field of study. Yes, I so understanding the act of understanding and knowing, how it, well, again, what does, how is that contingent upon an invisible, all-powerful all powerful deity existing at all? That's, that's the claim you've made, that without this, this deity existing, those pro God, the process... Or, to be very specific, the question that Martin God. asked, which I would really love an answer to, is in a universe without a God, you have asserted that living, thinking beings couldn't actually think, and I want to know how you came to that conclusion. Yeah, how did you derive that conclusion? Because reason and logic are impossible in and of themselves. No. Oh, well, well no, hang on. How, 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 what led you to that conclusion? What made you think that? How are reason and logic... Imp First off, explain what you mean by that sentence. To validate my reason or logic. Why not? Because it's circular reasoning. Ah, only if you're talking about absolutes, there's a difference when you're talking about an internally consistent... So, like, for example, I can't tell you, we, can't, we cannot ever solve the problem of hard solipsism. It's possible that everything I experience could be an illusion, I could be a brain in Nevada, I could be stuck in the matrix. There is no solution to that currently, and there may never be. But that doesn't matter, because I still experience a reality, and I'm still forced by practical necessity to evaluate that reality by that reality's rules. Because to not do so results in your demise. Well, but the rules that you're, that you're uh, that's like the rules for, for understanding language. You don't, you don't, uh, you don't when, you, when you look and you see something, you don't actually see the, the matter and the process. You, you just see the visual input. I, I don't understand what that has to do with what we just said. Then your brain has to then process it. So to what? Un to understand it. Yes, so what? And so without, without prior knowledge, which is what comes from God, you would have nothing. Well, let's stop, there's no, stop. There's no atheistic, there's no evolutionary idea or model that can, 
that can account for human consciousness. Okay, uh, uh, okay. just cool. uh, jurist, until you stop just asserting as an axiom that this comes from God, we're not going to get anywhere because you still haven't proved that. Things well, that I think, first off, some things that have not been shown to exist cannot be asserted as the cause of things. So you have not even shown that this God exists, let alone be able to state as an axiom these processes, these intellect, these thought processes, the processes of reasoning and understanding originate in God or must necessarily originate in God. And not only that, but you just made a fallacious argument which, under, which serves as the foundation for everything you've said. Because you've said that out, without a God, there is no explanation for consciousness. Now, let's assume for a second that we don't currently have an explanation for consciousness. There are people who think that we do have some good understandings and explanations for consciousness, but let's assume that you're right. What you're doing there is making an argument from ignorance fallacy. The fact that we have not demonstrated or have not yet come up with a proper theory of mind that explains consciousness means that God is the only answer for this. And that is simply a fallacy, and it's the foundation of why you're so amazingly wrong right now. <laughs> well, that, that and, the, uh, and the problem of simply uh, putting in your premises a bunch of unsupported statements, yeah. like X comes from God. Uh, you, X you've got only, nothing yeah. but assertions, and when pressed on it, your response is, well, you guys don't have a better explanation, which is a fallacy. Well, but you guys don't have any explanation. Goodbye. Yeah. If I'm going to sit here and explain to you the fallacy in great detail, and you're just going to reassert what you've asserted before, mm -hmm. we're done. Sorry. Yeah. This whole point of the, uh, the argument from ignorance fallacy is even if we didn't have a better explanation, that doesn't make yours right by yeah. default. Even if we found out that evolution was entirely wrong, that we had gotten it all wrong, that doesn't say anything at all about creationism. Yeah. Even if we find out that the Big Bang cosmology model is wrong, that doesn't mean that God or universe creating pixies yeah. or whatever explanation you think is interesting uh, is actually the right one. The, the time to claim that an answer or an explanation is the right one or the one that is most likely right is when it has been supported by sufficient evidence and when it is reasonable and consistent within this. It doesn't matter about this, oh, you can't, you can't prove reason with reason. Well, actually, um, I'm not going to get into a big, <laughs> big long tirade on the laws of log or the logical yeah. absolutes, but you can find me talking about them on previous shows, uh, and I'm not going to bore everybody else to tears with that. Yeah. So, yeah. And again, it's just so many of these conversations don't go anywhere because the Christian insists upon making these axiomatic statements that are things that have, that they don't realize they have to prove those things. Those are the things they're seeking to prove. Well, this guy, yeah. this guy, by the way, emailed you know, and said he was going to call in, and he's been running around that's, that's, over the course of a couple of days putting comments all over YouTube videos. And it's very clear that he thinks, uh, much like uh, Shock of God, that he's got some kind of gotcha. And mm -hmm. it's clear that he's been paying attention to the presuppositionalist knuckleheads like Saiten Bergenkate mm -hmm. and uh, Kent, uh, no, not Kent Hoven, um, Eric, Eric Hoven, uh, who, who supposedly wanted to debate me, but uh, evidently are just too doggone busy all the time to ever actually make it happen. Because um, I offered to take them both on, two on one, yeah. and mm -hmm. they declined. But, but I'd, I'd really like to know this. In a universe in which God doesn't exist, yeah, yeah I mean, what do you think... What do you think that universe would look like? What would be its laws? Uh, if, if, human, if, if thinking beings could not actually exist in a universe like that, explain why. Explain yeah. how you came to that conclusion. Yeah, not just what, what you think that universe would look like, but yeah. how it is that you derived that that is what that universe would look like. Yeah, because what can you possibly have studied? And it's the other thing, which we kind of let him get away with for a while, which was uh, he just keeps asserting God without defining God. Mm. Yeah. Um, there, there's no explanation for him. Well, God like, is this panacea which serves as an explanation for the things that he can't explain. Oh, mm -hmm. I can't explain consciousness, therefore God. Oh, we can't have an internally or a, a, an externally uh, authorized reason, mm -hmm. therefore God, um, without realizing that it doesn't really matter. I mean, have you, have you never played a computer video game, um, a, 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 an adventure game mm -hmm. uh, in a science fiction fantasy universe that has its own set of rules? you can still use reason within that scope, within the rules that are apparent and evident in that, in that universe uh, to figure out how to operate. And also, you know, one of the things we talk about is we don't want to necessarily pretend that our own experience mm -hmm. uh, has this primacy of authentication, this, uh, oh, I experienced it, therefore it's true. We need to be able to identify people who are having experiences which are inconsistent with reality in order to 
we put delusional people away, right. we put them on medications, we attempt to help them. Um, now, jurists and the others would say that the only reason we can do this is because we have reason and we have God. And I'm just going to use Occam's razor and excise that completely unnecessary God thing until you actually come around and demonstrate that it's not only uh, necessary but true. Mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, the way we go about determining whether or not a claim is reasonable, we don't rely just on ourselves. And science doesn't rely on any individual. It's through repeated tested, testing, attempts at falsification, peer review, this process of trying to demonstrate that somebody else is false, or that, that, their, that their position is false. That's the guts behind it. It doesn't matter if you think we're living in the ultimate reality or not. Um, there's, there's no problem with reasoning with inside a model. And it's always a bit funny to be told that you've got a circular argument going uh, by somebody who is, whose essential argument is logic and reason, uh, God exists because logic and reason are impossible without God. You know? we, yeah. are, we are able to use our logic and reason to talk about God because logic and reason are impossible without God. And, and what's more, just for the, the definition of a tautology, right? Just there. for the people who haven't been down this road 50,000 times um, and who constantly ask, hey, you know, how do I respond to these presuppositionalists who are raising this stuff like this? This idea that God is required for reason and logic um, because in order to avoid a, a circular argument, uh, is itself false? Because if, if you listen to, to theologians and the, the first question that you should ask and pop up is, can God change the laws of logic and reason? Can God violate those three foundational laws of identity? Can God make something itself and not itself at the same time in mm -hmm. the same way? And Thinking theologians will respond, no, that these, and they, then they'll take the extra step of saying, mm -hmm. oh, because that's part of God's nature. Ah, well, if it's part of God's nature, is there some reason that couldn't be part of the nature of the universe or even beyond the nature of truth statements entirely? You haven't demonstrated any sort of necessity towards God and your God hasn't actually solved a problem. Mm -hmm. What you've done is just say, oh, we need something outside of this, and that's God. Yeah. But you don't. I, I really got into it on, on Twitter a few days back with somebody who was having this exact problem. They started bringing up the laws of logic and, um, and whether or not, uh, you know, how, how do we derive those? And, uh, and then I was explaining that, look, these are descriptive and not proscriptive laws, which took them a very, you know, they had a great deal of difficulty uh, being willing to understand the difference between those things, and then even when he did understand the difference between the thing and claim to, he would still sort of make the same argument. You know, I, I would try to tell him, in a universe with no living beings, A would still equal A, and it would not equal not A. Yeah. That and you know, and he says, but without a mind, it's meaningless. I'm like, no. Well, without is. a mind, it may in fact be meaningless, but that but doesn't mean that it wouldn't that, be. But that true. doesn't mean it doesn't exist. If you remove right. every mind from the universe, yeah. a rock is still a rock. It's just that there's nobody to recognize that it's a rock. And, and if you took a new brain and put it into that universe as the sole one, mm -hmm. it could then eventually recognize these same truths. Yeah, there are, there are basic objective facts about reality that obtain without the need for minds to understand them. Yeah. But the the anyway. fact that something is pointless if there isn't a mind uh, doesn't mean it changes. Correct. Yeah. Because the, the, object, the, the, the uh, recognition of, of absurdity or pointless is something that happens in the mind. Mm -hmm. Doesn't change. You know, th th this kind of ties in with those ideas that we can change the universe by the way we think about things. That sort of the secret. Uh, <laughs> what the bleep do we know and the secret yeah. and all that. Uh, Law of attraction. Yeah. I, if I just wish hard enough for a rainbow that yeah. bunny who farts candy, I'll get one. Because the universe awesome. loves me. All right. Let's